think about um, yourself after you after you go to a concert. What stays with you? So sometimes there are very specific moments. You know, okay, I really like that part, which is pretty cool, and the sound was interesting. But then maybe that's two hours after the concert. But what do you remember, if at all? You know, it's it's a best case scenario. Yeah. You actually remember something. <laughs> But let's yeah. say it was a good concert. Okay, let's say it was something good. What do you remember after a week? What do you remember after two weeks? What do you remember after a year of seeing a concert? What really stays with you? Yeah. And I think oftentimes you have this this vague perception of, of what, what really happened, unless you really know the piece well. And then, you know, if you hear something for the first time, it's hard, especially if it's a intricate piece. But you have this feeling of, of something that took place in, in time, you know, and how it behaved over time. Like you talk about the Haas, you know, you, you have this perception of what happened in these 45 minutes. Although it would be hard for you maybe to pinpoint a specific moment. No, I moment. don't remember any specific exactly, moments. Exactly. But yeah. I remember feeling like this is different. Yeah. You know, yeah. I can tell you that. But can I say exactly what happened halfway through, two-thirds, th uh, way through? The, not really. Yeah, but it's like a train ride. I mean, take, take a, I don't know, a train ride to somewhere beautiful and you have a 10 hours journey, right? You can't say, yeah, after three and a half hours, I saw this That's and true. that was amazing. But just remember, you can say, wow, this is amazing, That's a good way to put it. amazing experience. And I only remember the temporality of it, the sense of temporality, you know? Cheers. Cheers. Thank okay, this is Uri Kochavi. Having me. Sorry. Not Kochavi. Yes. Kochavi. Exactly. All right, thanks for coming. <laughs> God. Cheers. Cheers, man. No, thank you. This is, a, this, is a, this is a lot of fun. I've been having people over slowly from Colombia, and this is another one of those, one of those guys over here. Uh, what year are you in the program? I keep forgetting. You're like a year under me, right? Fifth year? Yes, dissertation oh, year. Wow. So you're not teaching? I'm not teaching this year. So what are you doing? Uh, that's a great question. Because <laughs> <laughs> when you asked there, me that last year, what the is answer there was... to life if not teaching? Uh, I'm traveling quite often, as you know, because we tried to schedule this and I, I wasn't around for a while. So I feel like I'm traveling more than usual. Okay. Writing a bunch of... Like, I have a lot of time to write, which is really nice, you know? Yeah. Uh, something you always tell yourself one day I'll have all this free time for myself and I can really indulge, you know, and like every, So are you indulging beat. or is that like is um, the free time like See, that's the thing. When I have free time, I get kind of I have anxiety a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know how you feel, but sometimes when I have things going on around the composing, like when I'm composing, it's like Right. Okay, this is my time to compose. But when if I have the whole day free, I'm like, oh, I can compose any time of the day. Are you like that, or well, is it like, I think if if it's just you know if it's just one day or two days, I get what you're saying. But if you have a period uh, in which there's more space, you okay, know, just like free space, I think it lets you do things that normally you wouldn't do, like research, more research, more like trying out things. I felt like I don't I don't think that for me it's this year necessarily because I do have a lot of stuff happening. So I'm you know. It's not really that, but honestly, during COVID, that was really, that was really the vibe. The vibe to write. I mean, do a lot of research, a lot of stuff that I've, I'm doing right now. I feel like it comes from, you know, early COVID when I just, you know, we had this wave of cancellations that everybody had. Yeah. And at some point, like, okay, nothing's going to happen for a while. And I started doing things that, you know, they didn't have a, even a, sp a specific purpose in a sense. Yeah. I mean, I feel like us as musicians are yep. dealing with that more still than other fields and because i'm watching like the basketball playoffs right now because i'm a basketball junkie i like and it doesn't look like covid existed yeah when i watch those games i'm like oh there was no covid right like, at all but like when i every time i go to a concert like i went to the met to see champion yeah with my class uh, a few days ago it was like you still feel that COVID is in the air somehow. In what, like in what just way? the feeling, just the feeling of people not wanting to be next to each other or yeah. just people wearing masks, huh. you know, things like that. Uh, that's, it's still in the air. And, and also the fact that a lot of our music is still not being programmed or it's still being postponed. So yeah. I still feel like three years later, we're, we're, still we're still struggling to get our music out there and to continue on our path. But you talking about research, it's different because it's like you're still kind of in the incubation stage of, okay, I have ideas that need time. Right. Right. And right, is right, that right. What, that's what I'm hearing, at least. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I try to always be at that stage. Um, also, because it's part of my practice and what I do, I do a lot of stuff that is not just writing for instruments that I know, you know. Um, so there's always a very long stage of sort of hibernating, you know. 
Yeah. You take time to figure things out, technical things, conceptual things. So it's something that is very important to me. But then uh, when you are doing something specific for a piece, there's always kind of like an end goal to it. You know, you start working and, and you know, even if you have a lot of time, that it's sort of like everything sort of have to, you know, has to accumulate into this one thing. But because COVID was so strange, you sort of had this, you know, open space. Yeah. To, uh, you know, do, do you think that uh, kind of like a, something without a purpose almost which felt fantastic to me you know i know a lot of people really suffered from that um for me it was kind of nice like okay that's good that's now I'm i've heard both things it was a it was like a mini residence well not mini but yeah you know, a residency for a mini, some people yeah, for sure. and for some people it was like they couldn't ride at all or they're doom scrolling or this kind of thing yeah and it's it's tough because everybody has a different personality and you yeah. can't feel bad if you're doing something while some other people are, are not doing something. Yeah. Because that's that's also your way of coping with the situation. True. You know, your way of coping is to do research or to compose or to be active. Yeah. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Yeah. I, I was in... I was in a different phase at that time. Now, quick pit stop to let you know that I do offer one-on-one -on -one consultations and lessons in regards to anything composition related. This can range for helping you put together your portfolio for any composition degree that you're applying to, or you might want to improve your creative chops as a composer from week to week or month to month, or you might want to get a better handle of the behind the scenes of what it's like to be a composer. How do you sell your sheet music? How do you negotiate commission rates? How do you apply to contests? How do you apply to grants? How do you do anything as a composer, let alone just writing the music? So if this is you, you can contact me using the link down in the description below. I was, because uh, I just got married at that time to an Italian citizen, I thought, okay, well, I don't feel like composing at all. Let me just learn Italian and try to get the Italian citizenship. Wow. I thought, okay, let me do that because that, my brain will be active. But I wasn't really, I was composing a little bit, but not a lot, you know. So, so I feel did like, you did you learn Italian? Yeah, yeah, I got to a certain not advanced or anything, but enough to pass the exam. Wow, that's insane. Yeah, Wait, yeah, so yeah. you need you need to in order for you to get a citizenship, you need to learn the language and do. It's very exam. recent law that changed in like 2019 or 2018 that you had to learn uh, the language up to I believe it's B one or B two level. The highest is C two. Yeah. So it wasn't like native or ling uh, you know. Uh, it's just proficient so i can have a conversation i can get around i can that's, that's i can read nice. you know yeah. but it's it's very basic but i could do things yeah so now i'm eligible to get the citizenship with that so okay. that's what that was my project but i once covid hit that was like all right that's what i'm going to do for the next six months I, I signed up for the exam in november from starting in april right so by november i'm gonna i'm gonna get to this level in this language that's it so that was that was my project but if other people didn't have a project or didn't feel like doing anything that's fine too i mean yeah everybody course, everybody it's, it's copes fine. differently i'm just wondering for you was this um did you feel it's taking the same space like psychological emotional space as composing was this really no no no, no. nothing no. is like composing right no I, no I, nothing is uh, I don't know how. Did you study with Georg? Yeah, Georg most Frigikos? of my time actually was. Okay, with Georg. so you're you're you also were with him for a while. Yeah. I don't know how you are, but studying with Georg, especially those first couple of years before COVID, for me, I didn't really like composing that much. Hmm. To be honest with you, I kind of didn't. I wasn't really into it. I liked the result of it, but I didn't really enjoy the actually doing it and seeing how he was how excited he was to like finish the lesson and go compose. Yeah. That was like, in fact, I don't know how, but how, if that's how, what you felt in your lessons, but it was infectious. Yeah. For yeah. me. Yeah. I, I definitely feel that about Georg. I think, um, yeah, it, it, it seems as, as if almost everything in life is just around, com like composition is really the center and everything is, you know, is around it. And, you know, there are th certain things you have to do as a person in the world but then you always go back to the center which is i agree it's it's inspiring you know that's that's the first vibe that i got from him it's just just as an artist you know it's not even about composition or about craft or any any of these things it's just the the space that this takes in his in his life so, yeah. yeah i mean for me that was what i needed because i 
I was getting the accolades and all that crap, and but that didn't it didn't the inside like I was writing. I was like, why am I writing? Like, what's the purpose of this? But he, so after those two years and then during COVID, it, like once I started to write again, I was like, oh my god, this is like this is what I need, you know? Like I need to do this. But that was because you saw him, what what it means to him to compose. Oh yeah, I yeah. saw how it affected him. I saw that what it what it could do to the spirit also and yeah. trying to man, not manufacture but try to get in that mindset hmm. myself so consciously consciously get in that mindset don't just huh. let it happen like consciously say hey this is supposed to be exciting you're making something out of nothing right you know and not to sound like you know no but it is good gushy or what about it or whatever but that's that's the honest truth i mean yeah. that's why we're doing what we're doing instead yeah. of uh, other you know forms of art or even other kinds of other fields in general i mean this is why we're doing what we're doing you know and the fact that we know people also doing it at a high level mm. is also a big plus about it which also I, i took for granted too um the last five six years i would say it's part of why i'm doing this you know because i i see people you know at concerts five minutes two minutes 30 seconds oh hi you know your piece is great blah, blah, blah. But that is great. That's that's. Or, that's or, oh, oh, I love really that word. Or, you know, <laughs> Amazing. You know, I feel like what, in New York, what does everyone, that mean? that's that's what everyone says all the time, yeah. right? Your but I want to. I think with you, we need to go into the music straight away because you're talking about the research. You're talking about uh, the things that you learned over COVID, etc. Like we need to hear some of this stuff. So I want to go to relics of movement for flute, tenor sax, <clears throat> violin, cello, piano, and electronics, which you wrote in 2021. Let's hear a couple minutes of that. So I didn't play from the beginning of mm -hmm. this piece. I played from this section that, to me, uh, I mean, your music, it doesn't have the kind of elements where I can foresee what's going to happen, like a typical kind of you know, traditional Beethoven sense. You kind of get the motive or whatever in the beginning, and then it kind of... Yeah. It had no, your music doesn't do that. It starts with something, and then it stops and does something again, but that there's something from the beginning that's in there, but not really. You can't really... It's like disguised. And this part that I play, just so you know, is the part where the ch uh, the violin and the cello they're doing this kind of like these jumps with these kind of scratches um and then the the um there's there's like these uh, th there's just like a loop that just keeps on going it's probably six minutes or so into the into the piece right right or right. four minutes into the piece or so there's like this loop that happens mm -hmm. for like two and a half three minutes it just kind of keeps going right i don't know if you remember the part that i'm talking about yeah i think so i think so And you got this like this uh, tremolo thing going on with the uh, right. which I've never heard in a piece before right, before right, I heard right, your right, music. Right, right, right. 
So, I mean, you don't have to speak about that part specifically, but just the piece in general. Um, that was the part that I just thought would be a nice insertion for this show. Because yeah. you can kind of get into that sound, I feel like, more easily in just two minutes. Yeah. that's how much I showed. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, what, how, like, when you say research, what do you mean? Uh, what do you mean by that when you hear, when you write something like this, rather? Um, well, I don't know if research actually, I might, I don't know if, um, if it's exactly the right word, but um, in my process, because I work a lot with, with expansion, with this idea of multiplicity of, of sound sources, basically. You know, so I use traditional instruments, but I always try to kind of find ways in which these instruments um, have some sort of a relationship with other things that are not necessarily musical instruments. So objects, different so sorts of uh, sound sources. So oftentimes it will take me time to literally build these things, you know, to find out, to really articulate these specific sounds. Like you're talking about this, this tremolo kind of mm -hmm. thing, you know, it's, it's basically a guitar pickup, you know, it's a $10 guitar pickup that I bought on Amazon and I just cut it and I literally connected it like a sort of the cable directly to go inside uh, an amplifier. Sounds kind of like this, actually. Yeah, this, uh, <laughs> we have a, a lawnmower going on in the background, but don't don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, I mean, literally, you know, just figuring out how to, that that's actually a very simple kind of thing, but figuring out that this is the sound that I'm looking for and how I want to incorporate that in that piece. It, it's something that, you know, it's part of the composition. It's not a separate process for me. But obviously, it's it's something that takes a little bit of time. To Is that out. the starting point, though? Because like your stuff, it's so about the sound, you know. Yeah. Like I feel like more than anything else, because as a listener, I mean, you can't help it. You're like trying to figure out what you're hearing. Yeah. Before form, before um, any sense of harmony, timbre, or just any 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 really other parameter you're thinking rhythm. Any the first thing I'm trying to figure out is what the heck am I hearing? <laughs> you know, especially if you don't have the score. Right. Even when you have the score in front of you, it's still difficult to sight read through yeah what it is right but that's the most interesting thing it's like okay what am i hearing and then after that that's why i played that sample from the middle because i felt like okay by this time we have our sounds established right and then we we're making music out of it if that makes sense yeah it does make sense i mean it's for me it's it's a question of vocabulary you know and i feel like every time i write it's almost like i wish there was an easy vocabulary for me to use. Like there is something I could just use and, and write mm -hmm. the music. But it's never like that. Every time I feel like, uh, you know, because basically we're just expressing something. You know, we're expressing ourselves. And you need to find the right, even before a syntax, the right vocabulary. Like how do you say this thing that you want to say? Mm -hmm. And for me, it's always the first process is always, the first stage is always finding the words. Um, and that's why it's, it's, um, there's no real separation between the process of, of discovering these sounds, refining them technically, conceptually, and the composition part. It's, it's a mixture. But I definitely, um, it definitely happens very early on. So I collect a lot of sounds. This is, this, um, uh, I suppose, I don't know if the first stage, but one of the first stages. I'm, I'm a huge collector of sounds. Yeah. Like I have these gigantic uh, uh, giant libraries of sounds and i just accumulate more and more when you say giant library of sounds you mean like like are you making sample libraries out of these things Reco or like how far does it go uh, for every piece there is a library basically mm -hmm. so i have this you know this folder on my computer with <laughs> okay. the piece's name and has you know it has all the connotations that i can think of so i mean there are sounds and then there is uh, words it could be either what i'm interested in that moment and i'll have some sentences that you know uh, for me are interesting to think about it could be visuals it could be anything i just dump into this file everything Brain I dump, can think. yeah yeah but sound is always the biggest folder and and that i put i just record all the time i record myself doing stuff i record i do field recordings i take stuff from the internet i do a lot of like if you'd see my Google search history when I'm writing, when I'm just, start, when I'm just starting a piece, it's like, I wonder how this thing sounds. You know? <laughs> I look for very strange things and I take, I just, you know, sometimes, oftentimes, most of the stuff I don't even use. But it's, for me, it's really healthy to, to gather. So I start gathering everything. Gather, like a hunter gatherer. Ex You're like exactly. A I really feel like that. Like I have to gather, I have to have a lot. And then I feel like. And then you can make your meal out of it. Yes. So to speak. Yeah. And then I have vocabulary, you know. Mm -hmm. No, that's that's a really good way to put it. And the other thing I, that, about what you said is that I find interesting is that it's about the sound. Yeah. 
like which is very different from from the way I approach it. I always approach things from like a like a general idea or something that has nothing to do with music. Really? And then yeah, I would say that yeah, because the the piece um, the the piece that I wrote for Ice, which we we had a we had a piece on the same program. I'm gonna play that piece very soon, actually, your piece. But I started with an idea. Like which it wasn't, was what? It was just uh, this idea of breath, hmm. the idea that it's your what's what is like the last breath a person takes. Huh. It's a very poetic kind of. But that's also thing. a very sonic idea. That's that's not. Yeah, it could be sonic, but it also can be just words on a page. I mean, it could also be that. Hmm. But that was that was where I started. What's the? Because we were going through COVID and stuff like that, and um, breathing and mass and things like this were in the in our consciousness. So I thought, well, I don't want to write like a requiem or something like this or a response to COVID. Right. But this is my my thought process. I never thought about this before until COVID happened. Like, what is it like the last breath of a human being like? Hmm. Like I never thought about this idea until we saw respirators and things like this. So right. instead of an elegy for someone that I knew that passed away or an elegy for just a mass of people in general, which I didn't think was a very honest way for me to respond. Right. I thought about what a specific thing that would happen to a person that happens that will happen to all of us the, what's right. the what's the last breath like so that was that was for me how how i started that piece but uh, i i also like i mean i wish i could write music like this where it's just like purely about the sound because at the end of the day that's what it is hmm. that's what music is i think per, like it's, it's literally about the sound if you yeah. do nothing about the piece the sound is there yeah that makes sense so um well, I mean, I, I, the idea that you described about your ice piece is, um, I mean, it's very beautiful. I, I remember when we just had the process of, um, we had this meeting with the players, if you remember, and I really um, I remember you talked a lot about that, but you didn't mention any of this during that process to the performers, which is interesting no. to me. No, I thought this, it was too personal. Yeah, yeah. so that, that's interesting, the fact that it was there, because I always uh, perceive that as a very sonic thing, you know? It's like it's a sonic idea. Um, but I have to say, for me, uh, it's almost like a, a conscious decision to write from an unconscious state of mind. You mm. know, I don't think it's, it's obviously the music is about sound, but I don't think it's, it's just about the sound. There's always, always, there are so many layers and meanings to, to things that we do, everything that we do, you know, it comes from somewhere. But it's, it's sort of a decision that for me, for my music to be as uninhibited as possible, I have to sort of distance myself from um, from articulating the ideas to just let them be sonic ideas, sonic creatures to really follow. Yeah, I sound. mean that's how I am with musicians. I never and my and my uh, idea about the reason I do that is because I feel like I'm wasting time if I hmm. start pontificating like this. Because like when we were in that Zoom call, we were in a Zoom call with the, these musicians from Ice early on the process. And we were basically trying to ask them for certain things they right. can do on their instruments. Right. And my me my mentality is, you know, I don't want to waste their time talking about my yeah. my ideas. I just want to hear the sounds. Yeah. So that was my way of doing it. But yeah, that idea was the first thing I thought of when I wrote the piece. Right. I just didn't think it was necessary to say. What but it how was. important this idea was for you? That's that's the, that's a question that I'm I'm interested in. You know, that's you know what that is. That's a remnant of me working with orchestras a lot. That's what that right. is, because I. It's even less. You go to the orchestra; they haven't. They they barely even read your name on the on the <laughs> on the part, you know. Like so the, barely the titles. So yeah. they just, you know, they're basically sight reading, which is fine. I totally get it. But um, sometimes they want to know what the piece is about. But that's usually if they like the piece, and if they don't like the piece, they're just going to play it. You know, they're professionals. You're just going to read through. Yeah, yeah they're, they're professionals. But I'm just used to that. I, I didn't even show up to the first rehearsal with Ice. I remember that. I was just wasn't there. I said, well, they can they can figure it out. I remember that. Every time I see something like that, I get a little bit jealous because for me, it's impossible with the music mm -hmm. that I make. You know, there's so much technical stuff that has to be yeah. figured out that I, I have to be there. Of course. I yeah. just have to be and to set it up. And even if I'm there, there's a good chance that it will take another rehearsal just to figure out the setup, you know? Of course. So of course. I really like when someone is just kind of for themselves to, you know, I'm not going to be there and it's going to work. So right <laughs> well and and to me it's you know there was also a conductor there so if the conductor sure. is there sure, you, sure, you sure, have sure. a little bit more assurance especially if you've spoken to the conductor it's true again it's like an orchestra yeah but we've talking too much about this ice thing without actually hearing it so yes let's hear a piece uh bricolage is that how you say that say it 
because I don't. Bricolage. I, I can't yeah, speak. Bricolage, okay. Yeah. From 2022, Amplified Ensemble, Objects and Electronics. I like the objects. It's just like, what, what objects? I don't know what the heck that is. Let's hear it. For this one too, I didn't start it from the beginning. I started it about um, actually near the end. I think around eight minutes in, mm-hmm. like near the end of the piece, right. when you have these flute and saxophone multiphonics, right. this four-part chord, like a like it was like a Bach chorale. You know, Ex- that's how that's, I thought about it. That actually. you uh, that you had, and then yeah. you had all this amazing stuff underneath it. That was this rhythmic um, accompaniment. To me, it sounded like a rhythmic accompaniment to the flute and saxophone. Yeah. But I feel like the first time I heard it, I heard it the other way, where the where it was uh, the flute saxophone was an accompaniment to all the other stuff going on, just because. Oh, that's it, interesting. It, it, all the other stuff was so active, you can't help but listen to that. But right. the, the second time that I heard it on my own, I could really hear the those multiphonics. That's interesting. Uh, yeah. As that for it was beautiful. Yeah, I really you know I really like this piece. So, and to me, it's 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 almost like an evolution of the the relics piece. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, I suppose, I mean, hopefully every piece is an evolution of the previous piece. You know, that's, I think that's, that's what we hope for when you compose. Every, every piece would be a progress. It, it's not like that every time in reality. You know, sometimes uh, it doesn't work Yeah, like but that, the way but you talk about your stuff makes it sound like you restart every time you write a piece, but that doesn't sound like No, that I don't to, think I restart. Like that to me, uh, I definitely don't because, you know, over time you accumulate materials, you accumulate ideas, and I think the best thing for me is when uh, specific ideas, specific uh, sound generators, they start traveling with me from piece to piece in a way that that uh, that they're constantly expanding. It's not like you know the same thing is going. On. This is something that I have a little bit of a hard time with, like taking the exact same thing that I did and using it again. But if it, if it's expanding, and usually it happens very naturally, you know, I'll do something in one piece, and then the next piece. Um, I'll have the same, you know, the same kernel of idea, but technically and conceptually, it will become something bigger. So then I know something healthy happened in the, during the process, you know. Yeah, I mean, and, and I notice things that are reoccurring just between these two pieces. Right. I mean, rhythmically, you like to use triplets and quintuplets <laughs> ad, ad nauseum, you know. And it's like, well, does he really need to tie, uh, you know, uh, this note to an eighth note uh, triplet and then decrescendo? Like, does it does it make any difference? But aesthetically, you know, it's it's it it does because you have it going on in places where it does matter. So it, you right. you want to keep it consistent. So right, just, right, right, right. So that to me was something. And then of course the obvious thing is using the guitar pedals with with objects that have not have no uh, have no business having those things they have no used business. on <laughs> exactly i think that's a really good way to put it they have no business with these things that's i mean for me that's that's kind of a that's part of the interest you know how do you put these things together that seem like they have no business with one another yeah. you know how do you make this thing work like if you have a violin and you have um, a fantastic violin player who's playing 
um, for instance, in this piece, he's playing a, um, a glass of wine that is connected, you know, routed through different guitar pedals and effects and, and stuff. And then he's asked to do basically the same, to produce the same material, a material that is very close to what he's doing on the violin, than to produce it on the glass. And he's going back and forth between this object and between the instrument. So what what happens there? You know, you have this this friction almost. This. I mean, to me, I couldn't tell when he was playing violin. That's fantastic. Also, <laughs> that's exactly the goal, though. You know, it's you like, know? Wait, is he playing the glass or the violin? And that was weird. Yeah, it got it got. It was weird in the beginning, but like that's why I played your music from beyond the halfway point. Right. It gets good. Yeah. It gets worth it when you get to that point. Yeah. And that's the other thing about. I mean, this is a different discussion altogether, but this idea of like people, you know, they, they kind of zone out after the first 30 seconds or a minute of a piece, but then you lose out on the experience of what that could do to you. Yeah. You know, physically. But anyway, that's a. No, it's, I mean, it's, it's thing. an important discussion. You know, I think it's like, a, it's, it's like a pandemic, really. You know? <laughs> we are all suffering from. Yeah. It's our ability to focus on one thing. Um, I have to say that my own, um, uh, the way I think about that has changed throughout throughout the years. Um, you know, if if this is the natural way in which people sort of respond to things and experience the world, well, mm -hmm. maybe you know, maybe we just need to write the music that that sort of ex not not explores that, but but accepts that. Not to say that uh, um, you know you have to let certain things go, but you have to take in consideration that this is part of what's happening. Mm -hmm. Because this is if if most people are like that, if you are like that, if I am like that, you know, in the way we we experience everything, it's not just music, but the world itself. You, if you can't sit more than five minutes in your room without checking your emails, yeah, uh, which is you know which is a problem, but I think it's a problem that we all suffer from. Um, obviously, it translates into the music. And then, you know, this brings in a lot of other discussions about, like, form and structure and, you know, all these ideas that we have from the 19th century and unity. You know, there is, the, I think, in composition, especially in academia, there is this constant interest in unity and things have to lead to one another and it really has to make sense. But then you think about how most people today experience the world and it, it doesn't make sense that way. You know. No, there's no there's no unity in your day to day life. Exactly, it's not like you get up. Exactly, and, and you go from from different uh, state of minds all the time, from one to another. This is this is just you know a modern life. So why are we insisting so much on having unity and logic in, it's a in good music? Point. I never thought about it that you know? way actually, because I'm just, I'm obsessed with unity. You know? I I, yeah. I think we all, I think this is part of the the issue with you know with. Um, with music and academia, you know, there are a lot of fantastic things. Both of us spent so many years in, in these institutions. Um, but we are used to looking at the past and, and trying to, you know, to ask ourselves, okay, how can we take these ideals, these aesthetic ideals, and make them possible today? And there are certain things that we take for granted, like the, you know, how we treat time and how we treat form. So, okay, the materials could be completely different, but then we need to have unity and we need to add an arch. And to me, it's really strange, you know, sometimes you hear pieces of music that are really radical and it seems like, you know, everything is just insane. And then the form is like a rondo form. That's how and I feel every time I write. <laughs> but, but it's like, wait, hard. It's ABA yet yeah, again. You know? <laughs> and, and it's really hard to get away from that. It's really hard because I think we really internalize these sorts of, uh, these sorts of forms. But if everything else is, is different, why do we still have to have these, hmm. these sorts of... Uh, these I think it's just comforting, structures. you know, also. There's the idea, especially the ABA form, it's comforting to go back to something that, we, that we're familiar with. Yeah. And that's also, I mean, that's a life thing too, but life on a grander scale. Like, it's comfortable to go back to see your parents, or it's comfortable to go back to your home uh, you're, you're, or maybe it's not comfortable for some people. But at least for me, it's comfortable to go back and like, on, like life on a grand scale. But like day to day, our life is not ABA, exactly. except getting up in the morning, doing your thing. Yeah, that's the B, and A is I that's, guess going back to sleep. Definitely but, the B. Yeah, but I, I definitely struggle with this, this, this ABA thing. Like all my pieces are like that, and only the last couple of pieces I've written, I, I've done A B. Huh. <laughs> I just lose the A. I'm like, you know what? I they heard the A. I don't have to do A again. Let me just end the piece there. And this piece I'm writing now is like that. It's A B. And the last piece I finished was A B. And do you feel these pieces are less comforting because you said there's comfort in coming back to A? You know. I don't know. It's I, I need to. Hear, I haven't heard them yet. Right. Like I haven't heard the musicians do right. it yet. 
Right. So I don't know, but to me, it felt right to not go back yeah. to A. Yeah. Like, why? Why do we need to? Especially if I spent so long in A. Yeah. That's the other thing. I'm, I'm learning that, you know, in my material, I don't have to change so much. I can just mm. kind of sit in a sound. Mm. And that's kind of like what you do, too. Once you find a sound that you like, you kind of sit in it. I mean, not like for 20 minutes, but you sit in it for a good, a longer amount of time than a lot of some of the other material, which kind of goes by in 20 seconds, 30 seconds. But then when you sit in a sound for two, three minutes, to me, it, it feels like I'm listening to, uh, you know, glass or something in yeah. a weird way. Because yeah. I heard all these different things going on for the first six, seven minutes of a piece. And then I get to minute eight and you sit in a sound for two minutes straight. I'm like, whoa. That caught my that that catches me right, and that is a type of form, right? Definitely, right? definitely. And like I, I don't hear that in much music, so it made me stop and think like, why am I being affected this way? Hmm. And it was the form. It's just this unusual form, yeah. That I wouldn't, I would not have predicted. Hmm. So that's the thing. Like if you're listening to a piece of music for thirty seconds, like at the very beginning, they might just click off, but they right. they will miss that that moment you know, nine minutes, 10 minutes in, we're like, oh, crap, you know, I just, I just experienced that. So, yeah, I think, you know, that, that's, that's, uh, that's really interesting to me, what, what you were saying. And I think, um, you know, this A, B, A, B, A um, concept that you're talking about, I feel like uh, basically everyone's struggling with that, you know, still our generation that, you know, broke so many paradigms. And we have, I feel like we are the generation that really have, we have everything at our disposal, everything. It's not something that existed 30, 40 years ago, you know, because genres are breaking down, everything's breaking down. Like this is, this is the time that we are at. Yeah, know? we can write whatever the heck we want. Yeah, post, even in post academia, you can exactly. write even in ac- Exactly, even in yeah. academia, which, which yeah. I think tells you a lot. But still, temporality is something that we keep going back to old ideas and old forms about hmm. how things go from one part to the other. You know, we still have this axis, this temporal axis that really makes sense if you want to, you know, understand time and, and life. You know, you tell yourself, okay, we start this place on the axis and we go here and then we go here and this is how time moves. Mm-hmm. But this is not how we experience time ever as human beings. No. Never, you know. Especially now. Ever. I mean, this is not how you experience your life. You know, the past is constantly present and it's co- constantly projects to the future and what you're doing right now constantly shapes the past. Mm. It's just constantly in this mix, you know, things are, are going in, in many different directions all the time. Mm. But then when we write music, we often have this feeling that we have to have this axis, you know, we start here, we go here, and then we go here, and the form makes sense. That and doesn't make sense. Everything in the past needs to be exactly. developed in yeah. some way. Yeah. Or yeah. else you just don't, you're not a good composer. You yeah. know what you're doing. But for me, some of, some of the insane things that I've experienced in my life, you know, not, not major thing, but just I mean, just take the subway from Brooklyn to Manhattan, yeah. 2 a.m. You know, you see things that never repeat, <laughs> <laughs> but they stay with you. You know, it's like, what the fuck was that? Right. You know, like what? But this is, okay, this is, this is a thing that happened. I'm going to keep that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. But that same train ride at 2 a.m. the next day, you don't remember it at all because nothing happened. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So I think, I mean, you know, it's a huge question. I think about that all the time. I think that, I mean, my ideal when thinking about form is to be able to produce something that is as close as possible to the way that I experience time and memory. You know, I try to think about how I remember the past, how how I think about the present right now. What does the present suggest to me in the sense of the future and the past and can i write music that gives the same sort of temporality and i i I don't i don't think it's possible you know to be realistic music i don't think music really can do that but just as an as an aesthetic ideal to try and get to to a place that is even close to that feeling of being you know yeah this feeling of materializing what you mentioned is is crazy to me because now i'm I'm thinking back to so many lessons that i've I've taught students Mm -hmm. and the common thing that everybody has that, that they all want mm. is that they have so many ideas and yeah. they don't know how to develop the yeah. idea, which I think is important, right? Definitely. But at some point, like where, where you're at, especially, you know how to do all of that stuff, but you don't care about that anymore, mm. you know, because that's not what life is really. Yeah. I mean, some things develop, but some things just stay the way they are. Yeah. And I feel like that is really the point that, you know, that's when you know, okay, I... I am past that kind of like beginner composer stage mm. and I can get to a place where I really want, I am really controlling time. Yeah. 
Yeah. And it's, it's the same. Every student, they, they, they have 10 ideas in like two pages and yeah. they want to figure out how do I just take that one idea and make it 10 pages, yeah. which makes sense. But in the end, that, that there are 10 ideas in two pages is maybe the maybe what they will end up doing 10 years from now. Yeah. Keep going with composing. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I really agree with you. I think, I mean, it's an issue. I think we, we've all, all went through that stage. For me, it was really important to to get to a stage where, you know, I spent a lot of time being able to to do this thing that you're talking, you know, speaking about your students, to be able to, you know, take this one thing and really squeeze everything out of it. I mean, I love that, you know. I love every time I teach um, the music hum class and I, I teach uh, Beethoven 5. So every time I go back, it's insane. You know, it's ridiculous how many times I listened to this piece and analyzed it and taught it. But every time it's still like, this guy's insane. You know, how it's, it's, it's com- for me, it's completely... OCD music, you know, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is obsessive. Yeah, completely. That way, yeah. Um, and you know, I, I, I think it's it's quite amazing, and uh, it's it's really important, I think, for your craft to be able able to have this this holding hand, you know, to to control at some point to reach out into the piece and say, now I need to do this with this one thing. But then it takes a lot of control to be able to do it with certain things and with other things to just sort of let them live. And I think a lot of the music that I like is able to do that. So it gives you a sense of, of a compositional craft, a compositional mind that is leading something. But at the same time, it's not, you know, going everywhere. It's, there, is still, there still seems to be some sort of a root. Yeah, I mean, I have to be honest. The, the music that I like, it's still kind of this unity thing. Right. I have to be honest. Like yep. when I listen to a piece of music, I still fo- try to follow that thorough line. Right. And... You know, even talking to you now, it's actually getting me excited. I'm like, because like listening to your music too, like the, the music doesn't need to just be that. You know, mm. like why, like like uh, like John Adams, Harmona Lear. Like I love that piece, and it has a nice thorough line. And you, you know, even pieces like Andrew Norman's play. Yeah, yeah. It's chaotic, right, in right. the first couple of minutes. But you know, if you listen to the whole 45 minute thing, yeah. it, it it really is just yeah, an it arc. makes sense. It's just an arc. It really makes sense. Not to, I'm not trying to dumb it down at all because it's extremely complicated music. But when you really if you really just kind of zoom out, it's a it's a big arc that piece, yep. and you know, in vain is like that. Haas in vain is, hmm. is kind of like that. I think it's just like this big. Uh, it's not like this. It's more like this. But it's it's a broken arc, I think, in vain. Yeah, but you it's know? still there's still an arc. Yeah, it's still a bit true. of an arc. That's there's true. still a sense of that. So, to hear these pieces that that don't quite do this for me, it's hard to get. It's harder to get into them. Hmm. But maybe I just have to readjust like readjust my perception also because hmm. i'm so used to hearing beethoven and strauss and sibelius and all these guys yeah like, because i grew up in a conservatory setting right I did everything until 2004 2016 i was in a conservatory right setting so it's quite recent for me to yeah to kind of readjust especially with temporality right so i'm still working on that but yeah. hearing your music gives me kind of like okay there is not permission that's not i don't like to use that word but at least to see this is another way of doing it and it's totally valid. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, I also grew up in that sort of environment and that's a lot of the music that I, I still yeah. love today, you know. Like, um, um, you know, I, I have to say that every once in a while I find myself missing this ability to do some things that were possible to do. And, you know, if you if you think about the aesthetic of, of Beethoven, you know, I would work with my materials and I would say, I really wish I can have, like, a second inversion here, you know, of, of what, you know, <laughs> you know, it's obviously not a second version, but you know what the second inversion gives you as a composer, this possibility of bringing something back, which is kind of, you know, um, so, I mean, there's a lot to do in that sense. Uh, um, but, but yeah, I mean, for me, this is, you know, we, t- we talked a little bit on the way here about how composing is related to, to the way you live and what sort of, what sort of part it takes in your life. And, and I think at least for the stage that I'm at right now, um, I really try to think about making music that would be as close as possible to the way I experience the world, you know, just as, as a person, you know. And if this is how I experience temporality, this has to be projected uh, into the music. It has The music has to represent, I mean, it doesn't have to do anything, but I would like it to, to represent it in, in a certain way. Yeah. So that's, um, 
yeah, but I really like beautiful forms that just make sense. You know, it's 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 comforting. It's beautiful. It's, it's it it makes sense. So obviously, I enjoy these things too. I just don't feel like uh, oftentimes that they really capture my experience of things. You know, when do you have these arches in life? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, like never. That's true. That's a good point. You know? And um, I mean, we've been talking about form so much. I mean, I feel like uh, for composers, especially people you know that are that have been writing for a long time, it, it always ends up coming back to form. Right. It's always comes back because you can talk about these little minute details all you right. want, but it's that, especially when you go to a concert, it's that you don't, I don't really remember specific moments, but I remember like in general what I felt right. when I listened to the whole thing. So I think that's why form becomes such a huge topic the, yeah. the further along you get. Yeah. In the beginning, it's all about finding an idea or do I even like composing yeah. to begin with? Hmm. Do I even like coming up with ideas out of nothing? That's step number one. Yeah. And then step number two is, okay, how do I get this? one measure, two measure, eight measure idea to two pages, three pages. And then the next step I feel like is figuring out how all the instruments work, hmm. getting your stuff played, all the mechanics of that. Right. And then at a certain point, all right, I want to write a, okay, what's my like, what's my idea about in general why I'm doing this after right. all that. Right, right, and right. And then right, the form right. I feel like is the last thing that gets put into consideration. Even this piece that uh, you can listen to on YouTube, Viter and Viter and Viter. Have you heard this piece yep. by ha by Haas? Yeah. I mean, you know, I've heard so many pieces by him, but then I hear this thing, and it's like another forty five minute kind of piece. But the form is completely different than anything right. he's written before. Right. So this guy who's like in his mid sixties, late sixties, or whatever, right. how, however old he is, he's still thinking about form. Definitely. That to this, to the, like, it's there is no set formula he has, even though. A lot of the musical materials he uses are very familiar if you listen to Haas. Yeah. The form is what's completely different. So it gives me like kind of this thinking in the back of my head. Maybe that's what it's all about at the end of the day. You know? Well, uh, you know, I, I think that in a sense it, it really has to do with, with, uh, with uh, our perception of, of time and, and memory, basically. Because think about um, yourself after you, after you go to a concert, what stays with you. So sometimes there are very specific moments, you know, okay, I really like that part, which is pretty cool, and the sound was interesting. But then maybe that's two hours after the concert. But what do you remember, if at all? You know, it's, it's a best-case scenario. Yeah. That you actually remember something. <laughs> but let's yeah. say it was a good concert, okay? Let's say it was something good. What do you remember after a week? What do you remember after two weeks? What do you remember after a year of seeing a concert? What really stays with you? Yeah. And I think... Um, Oftentimes you have this this vague perception of, of what, what really happened, unless you really know the piece well. And then, you know, if you hear something for the first time, it's hard, especially if it's a intricate piece. But you have this feeling of, of something that took place in, in time, you know, and how it behaved over time. Like you talk about the Haas, you know, you, you have this perception of what happened in these 45 minutes. Although it would be hard for you maybe to pinpoint a specific moment. No, I moment. don't remember any specific exactly, moments. Exactly, But and I remember feeling like this is different. Yeah. You know, yeah. I can tell you that. But can I say exactly what happened halfway through, two-thirds, th uh, th way through? The Not really. Yeah, but it's like a train ride. I mean, take, take a, I don't know, a train ride to somewhere beautiful and you have a 10 hours journey, right? You can't say, yeah, after three and a half hours, I saw this That's and true. that was amazing. But just remember, yeah, you can say, wow, this is amazing, That's a good way to put it. amazing experience. And I only remember the temporality of it, the sense of temporality, you know? That's true. I took a train one time from uh, New York to L.A. Wow. It's a four-day train ride. Four days. And I don't remember anything about it. Yeah. Except that I was working in this car lounge and I met a few people that were trying to figure out what I was doing because I had all this music or everywhere and no Wi-Fi or anything. Right. But I can't tell you like what happened when we were in Albuquerque. Yeah. Actually, that's not true. I do remember there was <laughs> there was a big rain fall. OK. But that's actually the only place I remember, like all the different stuff because the train has to stop. Right. 10, 15 times. But the only stop I remember, I guess because it came to my mind, Albuquerque, right. is because it was raining so heavily that people didn't even want to get out of the train to go to the to go to the bathroom or get snacks or anything. It was that bad of a rainstorm. Right. But I can't tell you what. I know we trained. I know that we changed trains in Chicago, but I don't remember after that where how many where we stopped mm -hmm. except in Albuquerque. But what do you remember then? What from that from that train ride? Do I remember specific? No. Things what that do happened? you remember if you don't remember these specific things? I remember like, meeting this guy that um, he this 
one guy I remember he was like from probably somewhere in the south. I think that's where we, that's where we picked him up on the way. Right. And he was was asking me all sorts of things like, "Oh, are you writing a song?" You know, I think yeah. that's what he asked me. I said, "Not exactly a song. <laughs> it's a piece for orchestra." Right. And he's like, well, "What does that even mean? You're writing right. a piece for orchestra?" I said, right. "Well, that's what I'm doing. You asked me, so that's what I'm doing." But I don't remember anything else beyond that. I remember the thing with Albuquerque, the rain coming down. I remember changing trains in Chicago. But the rest of the trip, I don't remember. Yeah, but you still have a very strong sense of of being there, you know. So you remember specific things, and you have this yeah, this accumulated experience of of this these four days. Yeah, but I can't I can't tell you what yeah. happened on day two. Yeah, and I don't even know what day Albuquerque was. Yeah. maybe it was on day two. Yeah, day th- it was probably on day two or day three, but probably day <clears> three. But I don't I don't remember that chronological thing. So you would saying this stuff about how this is affecting the way you're writing your music. Mm. Just for me, at least, it's not. It never has been a consideration. Right. And it's just interesting to hear somebody else have a different take on it completely. Because at least for me, when I'm writing, it's more like it's more like spiritual in a way. Like I'm just I'm trying to create something that doesn't exist in real life. Right. The music has to be something that's like spiritual in a way that that's it's something that has nothing to do with real life. Because to me, the only thing I can control in this life to be honest, is with the music I make. Interesting. So why would I want to make it like real life? Because yeah. real life is just happening to me. Right. But what I'm doing on that page is something that I am doing. But then the thing becomes, I end up be, I end up uh, in these forms that already exist. Yeah, that's, that, I think it's that's like, a trap. Exactly, that's a trap. You see what I'm saying? Definitely. So it's like, a, it's a trick that's being played in my head. That's the trap. Head. Yeah, finding different uh, different temporalities, different linearities, or at least, you know, sometimes I... I really think about, and I think it's it's very difficult to do that with music, um, other than other art forms. You know, if you think about, uh, I mean, poetry, literature, uh, cinema, for sure, is really having this multiplicity of temporalities to give a sense that you have more, a few things going on. Not not necessarily in the sense of counterpoint, um, but in the sense of things that are moving in different time frames. You know. Right, when you watch a Quentin Tarantino film For or something instance, like this. Yeah, yeah, you know, that, def- I mean, that's one way of doing it, but yeah. it's his specific way that you can't really think what was he copying. Like Maybe from literature, he's copying a kind of form from literature. Definitely, yeah, yeah. But, you know, that I mean, when you say in cinema, that's the first thing I think of. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it makes sense. And uh, it seems to me, I mean, I don't know, I might I might be wrong, but I, I feel like, um, there isn't enough. There isn't an attempt to try and do that enough in music, you know, nowadays, to to be able to have this this multiplicity. Well, part of the reason I feel like is because we really don't know, mm. in true honesty, what our pieces are going to sound like until the musicians are all there. Mm. Mm. Like honestly, I even if you know what all your sounds sound like, right? Those. Even if you played all those sounds and you made a mock-up in Logic or whatever, right? It's not going to be the same as when you have those six, seven musicians with those That's same true. sounds all together, learning how to make music together with what you came up with. It's going to be different. That's true. Yeah. Do, do you feel? Do you find this stressful or limiting? Limiting. I don't think it's stressful, but it's definitely limiting. It's always a question that I ask myself if I. Um, you know, because there's this ideal that you want to be able to come to an ensemble, to an orchestra or whatever, and have everything, you know, to make sure that everything sounds exactly like you planned, planned, you know. So to be able to really control every detail. And if you're able to do that, then, then it's, it's successful, you know, because you know exactly what you want to get. And if you are able to get it, that's, that's done. I mean, it means that your craft is, is worthy and, and you're like... Yeah, project. you're a real composer. Exactly. You can figure out how yeah. to get what's your, in your head to, to sound the way you thought it would. Yeah, but then there's always the question of whether this is actually an interesting thing to do because there are human beings on the other side, you know. If you really want them to do exactly what you're giving them, how is that interesting? <laughs> you know, yeah, you become a dictator in a way. I yeah. Mean, if you're going to view it like that, I mean, it's, but they also, also from their side, you know, they're going in to do a job. So they are going in for that week right. or two weeks, whatever it is. And, right. they, and they also, they want to play what you wrote. They oftentimes, you know, they don't want to improvise or anything like this. Right. They want to do what you wrote. Right. Uh, they feel like they're doing their, their, their job description is to do what you wrote. Yeah. So to break that paradigm is also very difficult. I, I agree. And I, um, 
I am, I'm doing this a little bit with the, with the piece I'm writing now for Gudemus. There's, but I'm only really doing it with the percussionist, not, any, not anybody else, but this idea of like, you know, doing a little bit of what you want, but not quite, hmm. but a little bit, but that's, for me, it's very different. I, I, I'm that way. I, I like to control everything. I'm very, right. you know, neurotic about all of that, but uh, to, to let myself go, I think that's my next, at least for me, my next step, like, what can I, how can I let, get myself out of the process? Well, I suppose the question is, what would be the reason of stepping out of this process? You know? Yeah. I mean, well, I think well, part of it is just the obvious thing that to grow, to try something different. Right. That would be one thing. And, and the other thing is just a, it's a philosophical thing, just to give agency right. to, the, to the performer. I think that's important, too, especially if the performer wants that agency. You can't just do it with anybody. Some people, you tell them to True. improvise and they, they freak out. So it yeah. actually is a, it's a negative in that relationship. Yeah. So, I, but I think it's a work in progress, at least for me, for me, because that's, it's new for me and I want to, I want to keep growing, but I don't know if it's going to work or not. And I don't know what working means in this context. Mm, exactly. And then I could never do it again. Maybe, maybe I just try just because I want to try it. Yeah. And maybe that's just a reason enough. Yeah. That I just want to do it. And then, you know, could be, could suck a lot and just never do it again. <laughs> yeah, I think it's 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 um, a lot of it is about um, your framework t- um, being something that is um, that is set for you that you you are um, in control of the framework or at least you know what you want to get in a you know in a general sense what you are able to accept and what you're not because then you can create a space in which certain things can happen certain things cannot happen because oftentimes I feel like you know, in these, again, you see that a lot with people who just start to write music and then they'll do an open part. So, okay, this is open. Why is this open? I want them to to improvise. I want right. the performer to improvise. And then you say, well, you know, improvisation is, is an art form. It's a craft. They can do, if you just give them nothing, they can do anything. They th- What happens if they start playing a jazz tune right now? So, oh, no, 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 I don't want that. So, you know, you have to, to be able to create a framework that would make sense for what's going on and i think this is this is the difficulty in this thing to to choose that from a point of view in which you will not end up just controlling the situation but just verbally you know and i see that happening a lot like there is an open section whatever that means and people just direct the music no don't do that oh you can't do that please that's don't do really that and open. that well that's that's not an open section you know if you go and do that all the time so that's mm-hmm. i mean that's that's a really difficult question that i ask myself all the time because i have a lot of sections like this in, in my in my work so how do you create this sort of um, this sort of space you know in which musicians because i feel in a sense in a sense what we are looking for is for the musicians to feel comfortable with your materials you know or that you hope that they heard enough of it or they played through enough of it by that right. point in the piece where your expectation is that okay you you whatever you just played but make it your own yeah but don't yeah. go and do this other thing that yeah. you did it in, in an improvisation you know a month ago yeah in someone else's piece exactly but not every musician is like that and also not every musician of feels that's in their job description either mm-hmm. like their job is they they already are so virtuosic in what they do is that when you ask them to do something that they're not that you're asking them to do another thing on top of all the yes. things that they know how to do it's like okay really you want me to do that too and i could feel that with with my music it's it's with the the micro tonality really that is like when i'm expecting them to do certain to hit certain pitches and when they could hear, when they could see that I could hear that they're doing it wrong, that's when really that's when they get stressed. I could see it. That's very interesting. Because sometimes they think the composer just doesn't know what they're hearing. Right. But like when I'm there and I know that they're playing it. That's right, so and I, and interesting. I, and I keep asking for that bar. And it's like, how do you even like, well, because I didn't just bullshit it. Like yep. that's that's the chord I want to hear. Yeah. I heard it a billion times over here in this uh, little corner <laughs> on my piano tech. Uh, I heard, I know what it sounds like. Like I, I'm not just asking for a wrong note. I'm asking for that note. Yeah. And again, it's like, it's another thing in their list of things they have to do that they didn't learn how to do in a conservatory. And that that's hard to deal with. Yeah. I think. I think what you're saying right now is so important. And uh, for me, it took me it took me some time to understand that uh, because of the way my music is often constructed with musicians having to move away from their instrument, you know, the instrument that they spent all their lives mastering. Exactly. And then, in a sense, becoming amateurs on something that they've never 
an instrument, an object, uh, whatever DIY thing that they've never seen before. And I asked them to, you know, to apply the sense of, of intensity and meaning into that. Um, and oh, and somebody came. Somebody's here. And the dog is going nuts. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's why we do it's a lot no it's not a live show but <laughs> I wish it was it's live. not an edited show but i think i think this is a good this is a good spot to end actually because it's it's just amazing you know i mean we went through this whole thing i mean this was this was a one big temporal arc in a way because now we're back to objects <laughs> that's that where we true. started that is true. so maybe we didn't we didn't do this right either <laughs> we planned everything actually yeah, we, there, there's a written script there's it's it's, Danny, it's, it's, it's my on my here. phone yeah i have it here but anyway and with while objects. my while my dog is barking i you know check out uri's uh, music down in the description below make sure you check out those two pieces if you like them if you don't like them check out anyway you yeah. got this far in the show and thanks again for coming thank you for inviting me